uh, you will notice that we will have a, a theme uh, this year about virtual reality and augmented reality. And so uh, as chief scientist of ESRI, I'm, I'm Dawn Wright, I am very pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Nick Headley, who comes to us from the Spatial Interface Research Lab uh, at the Department of Geography, Simon Fraser University in Canada. And as a Canadian or transplanted Canadian, I'd like to welcome Nick to our Ohana, to our Esri Ohana, or family, and to our Ocean Ohana family here. Uh, Nick, you can take your place there, there at your cockpit because this is going to be quite a presentation. Now, I had the great pleasure of meeting Nick about a year ago at the Digital Earth Symposium in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. And I was blown away by Nick's presentation about the various projects uh, in his lab and uh, learned from him uh, via a very comfortable couch there at that conference. We had a nice uh, chat about common research areas, one of them being, of course, virtual reality and augmented reality. Nick and his students have been working in this area for almost 20 years. Nick certainly has been an expert in this for over uh, almost 20 years. Now, this is before virtual reality and augmented reality became such a big thing, uh, certainly before uh, the companies with their uh, consumer products, such as the virtual reality goggles and so forth, that uh, we are now very excited about with gaming. Uh, all of that uh, is drawing upon research that, that Nick and his colleagues have been doing for all these many years. And so now that's finally catching up. This is very, very important, very, very critical uh, for, for the oceans, uh, particularly for the blue infrastructure that Clint just mentioned. And you will see in Nick's uh, presentation uh, a variety of uh, wondrous things that are helping us to move into the next phase of what we are doing with GIS. Now, uh, Nick, in addition to uh, being a very uh, talented and communicative researcher in this area uh, at the university level, he's done quite a bit of consulting as well, including uh, a range of natural resource companies, science museums, uh, the BBC, R&D, and also Lucasfilm. So we are really in for a treat here, and without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Nick Headley to our stage. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Well, I hope I live up to that introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. It's an absolute delight to be uh, down here at the mothership, as Dawn described it. Um, and it was, yeah, it all came from that conversation on the couch during a coffee break at Digital Earth, yeah. And I think I probably prefaced many of my sentences with, what if, or have you ever thought about doing X? And um, so just a quick bit about me. Um, I'm a trained geographer. I did all of my graduate training in geographic information science, focusing on geoviz in particular. So I, I don't know whether any of you um, know the programs at the University of Colorado Boulder. That's where I did my master's. Um, you know, uh, drank the Kool-Aid of, of deeply engaged field research, all of the uh, data centers and um, you know, deep long-term research um, groups there. I did my PhD work at the University of Washington, um, where at the same time as getting a PhD in, in GeoViz, I was also a research scientist at the Human Interface Technology Lab, HIT Lab, um, which is sort of one foot in industry and, and uh, sort of uh, you know, big development sort of uh, work and one foot in high-end research. So, uh, and then after that, as, as Dawn said, I uh, did all kinds of weird stuff. So anyway, um, so for the past, uh, I don't know about, that's some time ago, for the past uh, 12 years or so, I've been up in British Columbia, Canada, at, the Simon, at uh, Simon Fraser University, where I established a spatial interface research lab. And this, this research lab is not trying to reinvent human-computer interaction. This research lab is trying to fuse the best and most challenging of our GI science with you know, uh, very much an, uh, an, an innovation skunk works mindset. If you want to think about what we are, we're a geovisual interface skunk works. That's what we, we like to do. That's what we thrive to do. So what I want to talk about today, um, and I apologize, I'm going to speak quite quickly because I didn't want to shortchange you guys. We've got a lot of content. Uh, so it's a bit like Clockwork Orange, right? So get, hold the eyelids open. Um, uh, I thought I'd offer some cross-cutting ideas, some what-ifs, and then I'd show you a smorgasbord of what we do, and I'll keep 
you know, provoking ourselves with more what-ifs as we go. And so what I want to talk about is um, some stuff to do with virtual environments, some stuff to do with the technology that you see, and maybe some suggestions for what we should be thinking about, as opposed to what sort of media hype would have us think about in terms of gadgets. So um, the title I, I, I gave um, Dawn uh, is, is this. So sorry about the play on words, couldn't resist. There's maybe a few more in here. Sorry, it's hard not to. Um, but really what I want to talk about is thinking about 3D viz versus 3D virtual spaces, thinking about what virtual spaces may be able to do that's different from simple 3D visualization. Think about what display devices you might have seen, what they actually can do. If you look at a piece of technology, it's like, well, it's, uh, you know, you, this is what you often see media hype on, you know, the latest goggles or what have you. And frankly, it's not about the goggles. It's never been about the goggles. It's not going to be about the goggles. Right? It's like that scene out of The Matrix with the little boy and the spoon. Right? It's not about the spoon. Right? It's about enabling, it's about uh, interconnecting, changing our relationship with data, data spaces, geographic spaces, and each other through these environments. So this will become a little clearer. Some other terms of reference then is, I believe that there are some fundamental opportunities in a geospatial context in particular to use virtual environments in, in their many forms to allow us to do many different things. And I've listed just a handful here. There, uh, there, are, there are more. But collapsing space and time, right? Clint was talking about how we can you know, thrive in 4D GIS. Okay? And you know, where does overlay go when it's volumetric and multi-chronological? Right? So we've got some thinking to do. We've got some solutions to, to come up with. Okay? So, um, and then one of the other things I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to go through this entire list, is this idea is what's our relationship with geographic space when mediated by and through these technologies? It changes. It cannot possibly not change. Um, instead of looking at data, looking at displays, maybe we're starting to look through the technology and, and lens the world in new ways. So let's just uh, start going after a few, few examples here. So, um, you know, uh, my team and I, we've worked on lots of different topics. Uh, one of the first things I did research on during my PhD was coming up with a new visualization to allow uh, environmental managers to uh, rework and replan the exposure of um, remediation workers to radiation at Hanford up in uh, Washington State there. And I used a time geographic approach to do it. So it was great to see the, uh, the time geography slide in Clint's presentation. Um, more recently, a couple of years ago, my team and uh, some colleagues over in Prince Edward Island, we, um, my team brought the sort of 3D geoviz interface side of things to the table, collaborated with a colleague who's a climate scientist who was involved in the um, uh, Nobel Prize uh, uh, winning team for the IPCC report. And what we basically did was we built a first of its kind um, interactive 3D environment, which allows the entire province of Prince Edward Island, an entire Canadian province, to have a shared, co-located um, tool that any citizen can go and use to look back as far as 1968 and as far forward as 2100, to look at where am I in all of the acronyms and all the abstract science I hear in the media, in the news. Where is my narrative in this? I'm really excited that Esri's um, talking about narratives in many ways at the moment. I mean, that's really, really important. And I think we need to ask ourselves, where are the narratives going to be in you know, multimodal interfaces and, and 3D environments and things like that? So what you're looking at is Lennox Island here and looking at its projected future, which isn't looking great because this is, this is the seat of the Micmore First Nation. And it's not a very large landmass, and that's the water treatment plant right there. Okay, this is not something that's easily or cheaply moved or, or rebuilt. Um, Prince Edward Island is really known for three things. Anne of Green Gables, it's a big sand dune, and potatoes, right? So, you know, the, the geological context is, is not encouraging, right? Because they're not just, 
you know, relatively low lying. I think the highest point on the island is something like 150 meters. But, you know, the geology is sand, right? And you, um, so there's, there's lots of vulnerability there. So we used a combination of spatial data, some LIDAR, some high-res imagery, and we created a, a caricature of the entire um, province, which is the top left image. That's the whole province. That's the whole island of Prince Edward Island. Um, and we, uh, we built this, this tool that you can fly around at multiple scales. So it switches scale for you on the fly, allows you to control and query the past and the future in terms of uh, understanding your present context by looking at the, the past trend. Um, you know, essentially daylighting data sets that have been you know, hanging around on dusty bookshelves in, in paper form in uh, government data warehouses and, and giving them new life and new relevance to citizens now and in the future. And it ended up being adopted. It was, it was deemed, there was this critical moment where we got to present it to the provincial government in chambers. And there was this critical moment where they could have said, you can't show that to anyone. It's too politically hot. It's too legally uh, dangerous. But you know what they said? Uh, well, actually, one of the things that one of the, the guys said initially was, uh, I'm not sure what we're going to learn. You know, these boffins and their maps, what are we going to learn that's new? So we flew them to every single one of their political writings and dialed, dialed time back and forth and showed them the past and the future. You could have heard a pin drop at that moment, and straight after that, they made it required viewing for the province. Okay, so they ended up sponsoring a roadshow, which was what these two images are from, where the tool, by the way, which we call Clive, uh, it's got a nice sort of warm, fuzzy sort of feel, I suppose. Um, but the climate uh, impact visualization environment, it became a, a resource, not something to showboat, but a resource. Something that can be used, not all the time. You know, it's not, let's focus on VR and tech. You know, let's focus on the issues of climate adaptation. Okay, so that's just one very quick example of uh, climate change stuff uh, and environmental change. We've also been looking at uh, this idea of being able to see things we can't normally see, right? So the, the first example was more of a chronological invisibility, right? Um, what we could talk about here in Vancouver, Vancouver, if you remember, do you remember during the, the Winter Games, there was this tagline of supernatural BC. Do you ever see or hear that? And yours truly was sort of saying, but how super and how natural, you know? Because we often get seduced by, you can't see all of it here because of the cropping of this image. But Vancouver's in a gorgeous setting. Mountains, ocean, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know, uh, sea life, what have you, right? We often get seduced that by that appearance, but we maybe, uh, you know, distract us from looking under the hood and looking critically at, at the, you know, environmental health of these environments. So, so the question here is, can we, can we do better? Can we, can we look under the hood? Can we use GeoViz? Can we use interfaces to do that? I'm going to speed up a little bit here. So you're showing a time geographic example earlier. One of, one of the first pieces of research I did um, at University of Washington, this is, this is a nuclear reactor at Hanford, and the yellow path is the vertical space-time path of a worker moving into a room of radiological exposure. Right? So imagine multiplying this by many times, many workers, and it gives you a sense of the kind of thing we were doing um, in a 3D Analyst. Anyway, so imagine applying that idea to the whole port of Metro Vancouver and taking the data from AIS and breadcrumbing the paths of ships through the port. So that's what you see, the little dots. Those are the breadcrumbs. The blue one is actually the sea bus. It's a commuter pedestrian uh, sea bus. So this is sort of a hybrid graphic. Uh, the blue disks are the, the locations of the anchorages, the de designated anchorages, so that they're designed to be moored at one end of a ship and allowed to flag in the, in the current. But you turn this into a space-time visualization, and it starts looking like that, which is either really cool or really scary. Um, but what, what we're able to do is we're able to look at the space-time trajectory of, of ships in, in 4D. And then we're also able to see, you see the cylinder on the post? That's actually giving us the, the space-time footprint of shipping. It's like, well, OK, fine. Um, why do this? Well, this is not just an, uh, you know, a GI science indulgence. The whole point of this is it gives you an architecture on which to hang environmental accountability and environmental footprints. If you know the geometry, 
the, the spatial and temporal geometry, you've got something to attach environmental performance on. So we've, we've built a few different interfaces to allow you to see this, one of which is a desktop interface, another one was a mobile app, which allows you to essentially fly yourself around a town, but you're looking at the virtual world on a tablet in your hands. Um, but there's another interface I'm going to show you a few slides from now. So that's all I'm going to say for, about the Port Metro Vancouver example for the time being. So sort of a 3D, 4D GIS sort of a, an idea. Coming back to BC, you know, I, I was really struck by some of the, the final comments that uh, Clint was making about, which in, in one form or another, we're talking about new forms of spatial data infrastructure. BC is a, a very complex uh, ge geographic uh, space. Uh, I've been doing quite a bit of work with First Nations in the central coast of BC, about an hour and a half north of Vancouver. And so we've been taking laser scanners. You can see this, if you look squint, you can see that there's a TLS right between us on the island. And so in, in April, we were zipping around on boats, grabbing this quarter of a million dollar device and trying not to break it, trying not to slip on the seaweed. But we're generating you know, data sets like this. This is not actually the central coast. This is somewhere else. But we, what we were also doing is we were also flying um, UAVs around and, and exploring new ways to um, generate data infrastructure. Because data is resilient. It, it is as simple as that. Until we showed up in this area, the best available resolution, well, let me just pause, well, no, I'll, I'll let this go. This is the kind of virtual environment we're building now. That's our virtual environment. Until we went there, the best resolution you could get was 20 meters. This is under a centimeter. Note that we're able to actually resolve the overhang of the vegetation. And if you look very carefully in the middle, can you see a faint silhouette of a bird right there? Sort of a faint red, it looks like algae. It's actually a First Nation trap line marker, and some of these are very, very old. So what we're trying to do with this is, is in the past, we might have had been forced to choose between photorealism and something that's spatially rigorous. And we're really getting to a point now where it can be one and the same. And this is very exciting news for work in three dimensions, work in virtual environments. This is some example of the drone work we've done. And then here's the 3D virtual environment we built from it. So we've done this for a whole collection of places up in this realm. And you know, the, the uh, Hailtuk First Nation, which is the nation I've been working with, they're ex extremely knowledgeable about both chronologies and environmental narratives uh, of their landscape. But it was interesting to hear their feedback of seeing their space through new eyes. So for example, Martin's Cove is behind their main settlement of Bella Bella. And so our 3D workflow allows us to do this. So the resolution we're able to project into future sea level rise, compared with Clive, it's an order of magnitude better. We, we can actually resolve something that's maybe an inch across and tell you whether it's going to be underwater or not, if it hasn't moved. We can also tell that too. In fact, we were struggling to find one of the brass geodetic control markers right here because of the post-glacial rebound and the seismic activity in the region. We actually found it inside our own virtual environment. We couldn't find it at first up in the, in the real landscape. So anyway, this gives you a flavor of the kind of resolution we're, we're dealing with. And what we've done is put this all together in a multi-scale 3D tool, which we literally just delivered a few days ago to the Hailtuk Nation. And this is now on a laptop, which any citizen can explore and understand their own community through these eyes. OK, there's, there's more of that. And if you want to see it later, I'm happy to show you. Let's talk about dynamics. One of the reasons I do a lot of work in unconventional environments like game engines is because of their ability to do topology in three dimensions, to do collision in three dimensions, to do physics in three dimensions. It's not necessarily a criticism of GIS. I think it's coming at some point, this conversion of simulation and modeling with what we're used to in a GIS framework. But um, I, I really am keen to uh, the work I've done for the last number of years is pushing hard to say, how can we be spatially rigorous, but while being um, methodologically forward-looking? 
So, you know, people in my team, we've done 3D marine debris accumulation simulators, debris that actually will tell you where it's been and how it's moving, debris that's taskable, so you can modify buoyancy, that kind of thing. You can also modify the, um, uh, the wave amplitude, that kind of thing. Something very new that we've, we're doing now. We can actually, we can actually take real-world data and actually generate those conditions inside our virtual environments. So we've actually got a workflow that one of my fabulous grad students, Sonia Argerson, has just produced, which allows us to take sea state data from buoys and actually generate the same sea state virtually in three dimensions in our world, which is hugely important for things like vulnerability analysis. We can also have virtual weather. So we've done, you know, we've done snow accumulation in 3D while, uh, while we're tracking the, the weather data coming in from outside. And there's other kinds of marine debris, Nick Benoit's work too. Something I'm very interested in, uh, well, I keep saying that, I'm interested in lots of things. Um, the fact that we're all here, we're in, all inter interested in liquids in some way. Um, so I'm, I'm quite interested in, in fluid simulations. Uh, you've probably heard of a variety of pipeline issues and, and that kind of thing going on in BC. Um, Helt, the Heltic Nation, the one I mentioned earlier, are the ones who've just had that devastating um, you know, a sunken uh, tugboat, which has leaked 60 to 200,000 liters of diesel onto their clam beds, what they actually use for food and uh, for, for trade as well. And uh, that's, it's deeply, deeply disheartening. In Vancouver, there's another, there's another uh, uh, band called the Sailbor Tooth, and there's a pipeline proposal. And the problem is, is that people are just having these tennis matches based on opinion, Pol politicians or you know, uh, industrialists, they're having this, this tennis match, which is, which is based on oftentimes opinion. And what we don't see enough of is giving the proposals geometry. Let the geometry speak for themselves. Let's look at a set of possible scenarios just to sort of get the envelope of possibility. So we've been doing things like this, you know, the what if, what if, sandboxing mentality, you know, pipe ruptures, what would it do? There's another one coming up. Different, you know, different kinds of it, you know. And obviously with visualization, we can give them different appearances. So we can then look at differential mixing and things like that. Okay. Uh, forward pressure, back pressure. Just gonna keep going. Entrainment of one kind of fluid with one viscosity and another fluid. Right? No one's saying that they have the answers out, you know, deterministically speaking, have answers out of the gate. But if we can start generating these, modifying the variables and figuring out uh, what the differences are, then maybe we'll be in a more informed position rather than just stabbing in the dark. Um, so we do a lot of work like this, you know, in collidable spaces where we're doing complex fluid simulations. This is a stream bed example. I just threw it in there because I really like it. Um, relating to my tsunami work, um, you know, we all saw the video from Tohoku a number of years ago in Japan. So, you know, we see, you know, photoreal fluids like that, but what if you could see velocity? So that's what we're doing here. We're looking at sort of human scale hydraulics for an, an you know, inundating wave versus a receding wave. I know that it's quite some interest. I think you're gonna see something really cool um, tomorrow from Brian's team, uh, thinking about um, structures on the seafloor to impede erosion and things like that. So, you know, we've been, trying out some hypothetical scenarios with rock placement or tides or wave breaking. Again, you know, we could look at it just in sort of a rendered uh, view, or we could actually see it with some kind of analytical component too. So more of a, a visual analytics side of it. And then combining the two, this is some of our data from the Bella Bella Hailsuk context, you know, somewhere between one and 10 centimeter resolution. Being able to isolate waveforms and just throw them at the coastline and start to look at, you know, what the outcome is. Something I would like to point out, and this is a challenge for all of us, I think. Look right here. What do you see? Logs, right? Something we've got to get a handle on here is how are we going to segment our volumetric characterizations of the world? Because in the right storm conditions, those logs aren't part of the landscape. They're going to move. So we need to figure out some workflow to intelligently identify them and intelligently segment them from the land surface so that we can then simulate them. Getting a slightly, slightly edgier, 
Um, you know, we've, uh, we've, we've started using some other tools, which I'm going to show you in a second, but this is sort of showing up close the, the resolution of that coastal data set I was just talking about in Bella Bella, but starting to provoke us with some other ways to, uh, other ways to visualize maybe current and uh, dynamics. But if you think about it, everything we've talked about so far really has been you know, 3D on a screen, 3D on a desktop computer, you know, the, this 3D thing that you look at. So what else could we do? What if we could, you know, understand more, in a more sophisticated way other kinds of relationships, not just looking at, but looking inside? So the themes I'd like to talk about for the next short while here are thinking about display technology, whether it's a screen or your phone or a tablet or goggles or anything else. Don't think of them as a display or a device. Think of them as a portal, a window. The portal could just be to look through or it could be move, to move through. I would suggest that you know, virtual environments can be not just virtual environments, but they can be teleports. They can be wonkavators. Anyone know what a wonkavator is? Yes. What's a wonkavator? It's like the ultimate elevator that can move in any axis, right? We've been using a wonkavator. Um, you know, the idea of a bathysphere, but think of it in a 3D virtual environment context a spherical space that you can move through and browse through high dimensional data sets, right? In fact, it's already going on, okay? How many people use 360 video? Okay, in a way, 360 video gives you video spheres, right? And in a way, that spherical capture of the world moving through the world is like a sphere, a spherical wonkavator, and the only limitation is where you actually take it. I have to admit I've been hacking my drone and I've been actually flying my drone with a 360 camera off it. Uh, yeah, there's some interesting avionics going on with the drone. It's like, it's not rated. I was using one of those phantoms, had a 360 camera on the bottom. The drone's doing this, trying not to explode or crash. Um, but we can do it. We, we, we can, uh, we can, you know, these, what we're, what we're talking about here, we're not talking about necessarily sort of branded solutions. We're talking about constructs, you know, metaphors of, of interacting with virtual content uh, for real-world problems. So in a way, we're, we're, we're suggesting that there are new kinds of spaces to be authored. You know, what is GIS transformed, if not transmogrified, into something wild but relevant, right? Powerful but relevant, but rigorous, right? So it opens up an, an opportunity to redefine where virtual and real are. Sorry, more plays on words. So what, what, what can we do with this kind of stuff? So this is a 3D space we've been experimenting in. So we've been doing some work in immersive VR, doing some work, work in other environments too. So this is just one, this is a play space I constructed um, using HMD. Um, there's my eel grass and I had a log there. And then I, was, I created this, uh, this black smoker, you know, the smokers off the coast of Washington and Oregon, California. Just saying, and then I also, um, you know, I'm glad you put up the, uh, the streamer visualization of currents. I was thinking, well, what if you could be in that? What if that could be around you? All I have to say is, whatever you do, don't put them everywhere around you, because you've got no frame of reference and you start falling backwards. Uh, anyway, have you seen this? This is an absolutely exquisite virtual experience done by Weaver. You can do it on the um, Vive, you can do it on Oculus Rift. It's absolutely gorgeous. Given what you guys are interested in, none of you would ever want to leave this environment. Um, well, it's quite clever, they defined a physical space that matches the tracked space in, in the real world. It's sort of a ledge overlooking a, an underwater abyss. And the narrative is one of different waves and pulses of sea life going past you. So, you know, this great big jellyfish comes by. Best of all, you can touch it, right? So you've got some force feedback, and I'll show you some force feedback stuff in a moment. Well, I'll show you it right now, actually. So, again, this is a 3D environment that you can look at on a screen, but it's actually designed to be looked at immersively with a head-mounted display. 
Here's one of my other guys, Ian Lockheed, and he's playing with anemones. So it's a little bit frenetic, the, the footage. And you can see a ghosted image of his controller there. But what I want you to pay attention to is his body language. Okay, so it's, the body language changes with the different levels of engagement. Um, so how, do, how are we moving around these spaces? I think I've mentioned this idea of teleporting, wonkavatoring versus uh, virtual bathysphere. What we really need to talk about is lost at sea, but in a good way. Lost in the sense of we've transported ourselves somewhere else. We are, our sensory architectures are engaged by and surrounded by such compelling, engaging content that we've stopped being in the physical space as much as we are now in that virtual space. So we're present somewhere else through you know, immersion in, one, in more than one way. Okay. So, so how are these immersive presence-building experiences going to actually do something for us, pragmatically speaking? I'd like to talk about how I think our workspaces may evolve in this with some examples. So I thought it would be appropriate to bring some Noah Bathy data. But what you're seeing here is live video directly from an HMD of us manipulating it in three dimensions. It might just look like a crazy fish cam or something. But we are looking at the Mariana Trench. I'm just going to fast forward. There you go. There's a slightly better view. But the way we're interacting with it is like this in a three-dimensional space, and we're pulling it and stretching it and exploring it, right? We're breaking down, perhaps, that formality. It looks like Ian just broke out of the jail or something, but um, he didn't, honest. He, he would kill me if I, he heard me saying that. No, no. Um, so this is how we're interacting with it. So we're using a Vive system here. If you look to the left, you can see me actually controlling our central coast data. So actually able to pull apart, modify it, stretch it, position it, et cetera, et cetera. Great for inspection. The, the first person experience is hard to show with these videos, but it's really quite something. It is, it is and as someone who's been in virtual reality environments a lot, uh, I'm, I'm really blown away by what they're achieving at the price point they are right now. But we've, so we've created this environment. Let's, let's look inside that. So we're inside that environment now. You're looking at the first person view. And here we are. We're looking at that data set. We're, we're modifying it, manipulating it. OK, you can see some more gestural interaction in the real world. Oops, let's play that. This is what I want you to see. What if you could do this with your GIS? And the best part is, there is no loss of resolution in that geometry. You can keep expanding it, expanding it, and you've got one centimeter resolution on the exit. It's like the ultimate geospatial puzzle, right? So we all had a go. It was like pin the tail on the donkey, right? Except, yeah, where does this piece of coast come from? It's somewhere along here. <laughs> but I'm really excited. We were just doing this just a few days ago. So again, we're escaping flatland, right? We've got some serious thinking to do as we transition from our cartographic inheritance, from layers into voxels and volumes. How do we overlay them? Or is it more of an issue of co-location or co-topology or something like that? There's other ways to interact with the content. Here's a tool we built to actually have rain clouds at your fingertips. So you're actually controlling that cloud with your hand. Right? Getting rid of keyboards and mice. Not in the way that Apple is. Right? You, we actually do need headphone jacks and things like that, right? <laughs> but uh, but the, the body as interface, right? 
We have a very, very sophisticated spatial measuring system, and we live in it. It's our body, right? We can make sense of huge things. So what if you had a scaled, tracked space that has an ability to switch between human dimensions and room dimensions and geographic dimensions? So it's almost like your room and your body becomes the scale bar for the data that you're interacting with in three dimensions. So what I'd say at this point is we've, we've challenged ourselves to think about what is real, what is virtual, what is 3D viz versus immersive. I think the things I'd want you to think about as a potential and opportunity of virtual environments is the opportunity to go places, the, the, the real promise here with virtual environments is an ability to go places, see things, do things to data and space that you cannot do in the real world for cost, lethality, uh, remoteness, that kind of thing. From a spatial analytical and a geoviz standpoint, it's an ability to reveal the hidden, to control and query. What are emerging capabilities are these ideas of experiential exploration. It's not just about oh, there's some data, I'm going to pop it in this tool, it's going to visualize it, it's going to give me some dimensions. Now think about standing on that ledge with a giant jellyfish. How does that make you feel? Right? There's a whole thrust emerging in emotional computing right now, emotional interfaces. Right? And I'm not so say, talking about sort of touchy-feely GIS or something like that. What I'm talking about is, does something about your level and mode of engagement inform you differently about what it is you're trying to make sense of? So that's... That's one of the things I'm talking about. Hopefully, you're starting to understand that, I'm sure many of you think of this already, though, uh, is, is this idea that displays and interfaces are only enablers. They're only portals um, or, or uh, transducers. They're not, they're not the end goal. They're really uh, you know, about connecting people. OK, the final punchline. How much time do I have, Drew? Uh, don't do that to an Englishman. Um, he did too, but the, not that way. Um, so what if our, our 3D spaces didn't have to stay locked inside of these display environments? What if we could do something else? So as Dawn said, I have a background in mixed reality environments. This is some work we published in 2001, 2, 3. I, I don't want to think about how long ago that was, really. But this was the first collaborative, you could call it a GIS, because it's entirely spatial data. Collaborative augmented reality GIS. You're about to see what this guy can see through his goggles. It allowed us to take a topographic data set and browse through it and query it with tangible interface elements so that you could pick it up, hand it to your buddy. What do you think? Interact with it as, as, as normally as handing a coffee cup to someone. And every user gets to see a unique point of view. It's not everyone sees the same thing multiplied. It's everyone sees the unique perspective based on their spatial positioning relative to the content. But that's some old stuff. In the intermediate time frame, I've been taking this outside in more ways than one. We've been using this to create prototypes for spatialized gaming to help build the brainware of resilience in children on the tsunami-exposed west coast of Vancouver Island. So rather than just you know, getting, getting kids to, to not just look at, but value maps and GISs, it's like, yeah, what does it do? You might be more successful in giving them Pokemon. But Pokemon's an awful example of augmented reality. Oh my god. And you can see it, it zombifies people. gets run over sort of thing, yeah. Um, so what this is, this is taking our analytical evacuation maps and using them to code, color-coded markers on the landscape, a bit like Pac-Man rewards, right? They're color-coded by more or less risk, and the idea is it's a curated, guided activity with classes of school kids who can start to build up the mental muscle memory of associating more or less risk from a path that they take across their own landscape. If we succeed, the whole point will be emerge, you know, a bit like the earthquake notification apps. If, if that kind of thing is happening, people aren't going to be looking at their phones. I've done work in Christchurch before and after the earthquakes there. 
people are not looking at devices. You've got to do work with these technologies to build in that brainware now. And we can, we've got such an, a massive intellectual capital just in this room to do that, so that the technology doesn't even have to be switched on if it's impossible to do so. Let's take 2D risk maps off walls and let's see them on the landscape at our feet. That's what we did with Arrow, augmented reality risk overlay. That space-time uh, visualization of shipping, environmental footprints in uh, Port Metro Vancouver. Why not take it out of that desktop? Why not do this? Why not see this? So that's the same 3D space-time GIS in the landscape with you. That's my vision for 4D GIS. This is a little bit on the passive side, though, and I can't help but share with you how we've been taking it further. A touch of rain, rain simulations. Imagine having an app where you treat your tablet like a lens, not as a display surface, as a lens. You look through it, not at it, through it. You look through it, you create a virtual cloud in real space, you task that cloud to emit a real-time particle si uh, system, and that particle system interacts with the real world. That's the best part about it. You can choose how much virtual and how much real. You're truly controlling reality, uh, how much mixed reality you have. This is us raining uh, a rain system onto the St. Lawrence River in Quebec City. Obviously, we're subject to maybe some of the data that's available there. But I don't just want you to take my word for it. I want you to see it. Interplay between virtual and real world. Think of, think of the skill capital and data capital this room full of people has at their fingertips. Can you imagine what we could build together if we did some collaborations, right? Doing this kind of thing. So we call this flexible mixed reality, the ability to do this on the fly. So we ended up taking this and turning it into something else that's rather fun, which relates to this conference more than the previous examples. The tsunami later. Sorry, I apologize for the color. No, I, no actually, I don't apologize. I like it. So, so, so stick a piece of technology on a beach. This is the west coast of Vancouver Island, a place called Euclid. This is, We did this a few years ago. The red is the risk zone overlay. But this is the world's first augmented reality tsunami simulation in real time. This is not pre-computed. This is computing it on the fly. That's why it looks big and blobby. We followed this up with a tool called Tsunamulator 2, very creative of us. In this case, you can actually use multi-touch to define the width and angle of attack of a tsunami wave, which is what my colleague, um, what my student Chris is doing here. And then you set it going. So it's location aware. You look through it, look around you, here comes the wave. And then I'm going to switch for you. So he's switching out of virtual into mixed reality just there. And this is what you see. See what we're doing? We're, sh we're shifting from completely virtual into blending it with our real first person and collective experience. Very recently, we've taken this and yet another step further. Sorry, yeah, I'm getting the slice my head off symbol. Um, Sorry, I really want to show you this. Um, I feel like I shortchange you if I don't show you this. Uh, remember that, that, that one centimeter resolution cliff I showed you? We use our room as a holodeck. So we can just slap that on the wall and browse it. OK, finally, last but not least. Ah. Ah. 
what if, what if your desk could do this? Or better yet, what if you could do this with your phone? Oh, or what if you couldn't get your, there it is. That is a augmented reality phone display recessing a bathymetric data set into your physical device. I thought you might like that for this conference. We finished building it about three days ago. And be because I'm out of time, I, I, I can show live demos in a minute. Um, but Ian Lockheed, one of my grad students, the guy who's wearing the prison suit, um, we, you know, the, the gift for Dawn part is, one thing we'd said when we were sat on that sofa at Digital Earth was, I said to Dawn, you know, what I really want is I really want an ability for us to show 3D in 3D. I don't want people just to try and figure out what they're looking at when they see a 2D figure in a journal or an article or a poster of something that should be in three dimensions. So where are 3D journals? Where are 3D atlases? So we built our first volume of a 3D atlas. And what we'd love to do is collaborate with you guys to build more of them, because we've got the workflow now. So what you're seeing is just on this laptop, I'm holding my mobile device. This is what I would be doing right now, but I'm just doing this for speed. Um, I'm looking through the phone at this physical atlas, but this is what I can see. So I'm looking at the drop-off on the Mariana. I'm sure there must be people in the room going, no, 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 that's way too much vertical exaggeration. So please correct us if it is or isn't. But this whole idea of completely redefining where the geometry of your regular physical space is, being able to switch data layers and data sets on the fly, making physical, tangible maps, dynamic and mixed reality and three-dimensional and animated and able to do simulations. And if, if you want to uh, have an in-person demo of that, I'm happy to do it in the breakout. So final comments. I've said some of this already. Um, it's, not, it's not about the technology. It's about what they facilitate with data, with each other. Um, it's very much about moving between worlds, right? We shouldn't limit ourselves to the virtual worlds of desktop computing or data sets. They, those data sets are about the world. What we've got to do is we've got to figure out the architecture to collapse the space and time and abstraction of those two extremes and make them the same thing so that it's less about going out to the field, getting data, coming back to the lab, processing data, going back to the field, or publishing a journal article or something. No, it's standing in the world and running a simulation on reality. So we've been trying that in watersheds in British Columbia. I think what we're going to experience is this. This is my final graphic. We've got this convergence of real and virtual. You've heard augmented and mixed reality in the media, in the research literature, with increasing levels of hype. But we're not in the business of hype. We're in the business of exploring where our spatial information economy is and where our ability to add value through these modalities lies in the future. Okay. So what we're talking about is humans in augmented and mixed spaces. And we're not necessarily saying it has to be super technological. It just has to be appropriate and rigorous. So I've shown you some examples of our, you know, our attempt to forge new paths in situated visual analytics, portable virtual environments, the tsunami thing, reification, showing the invisible, and a few different examples of augmented GIS and situated augmented simulation. All of these are new relationships between us and data and space. Thank you very much.